Turn your Bibles, if you will, to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. We're going to read verses 12 to 16 in just a moment, and they will set the stage for the lesson. But before we do that, I'd say my greetings this morning. We're certainly grateful for the presence of each and every one. We have a number of visitors, and we're glad, we're glad that you're here. We want you to come back and be with us anytime you have opportunity. We want you to know, as Brother Steve said when he made the announcements, we are open to studying with you. We're open to your questions. If you see something you don't understand, let us know. We'd be more than happy to set up a time to study with you at a time of your convenience, a place of your convenience. We can meet you at the restaurant, meet you at your house. You can come to our house, whatever you want to do. But we'd be more than happy to do that. I have some dear friends uh, that I worship with up in Fishers, the place where I preached before I moved here. They're here today. Uh, and I hope you, you take the time to get to know them. They are some of the finest people you ever meet. I wish the whole congregation up there could come down here and see us, but these folks came. We had a great time with them, uh, but you all have been informed, or I've been informed, you all can't have me back. I, the folks here said, they said, you all can't have me back, so I was told to tell you that. And make sure you understood that you can't do that. In Philippians chapter 3, starting with about verse 12, the Apostle Paul said these things. He said, not that I've already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting the things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we've already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us be of the same mind. Today we conclude our series. We had a series of lessons, I just called it, for lack of better words, my What Must I series. And we talked about what must I feel to be saved. That's where we kicked it off. And then we talked about what must I know. To be saved. We don't have to know everything to be saved from our sins. We've got to grow in knowledge, but just to initially be saved, we don't have to know everything. We just need to know we're sinners and that Jesus died for us and he expects us to put our trust in him. And we talked about what must I believe to be saved. And then we talked about last week, what must I do to be saved? And we finish it up here, what must I do to stay saved? Paul speaks here of the need to press on. You can see that uh, in verse 12. I press on. The idea there is growing and maturing in the faith. Uh, he sort of, if you kind of read it carefully, he sort of pictures our faith as being the, uh, uh, as though we're climbing a hill. At the top of the hill is heaven. At the top of the hill is Jesus. At the bottom of the hill is where we started our journey, and we're climbing to the top, and so we're pressing on. And in this discussion here, in these verses, there's no room for going backwards. It's continuing to press on, continuing to climb up, up, ever upward. Uh, we learn and we grow and we adapt. We adapt our beliefs and practices and we adjust our lives as we learn. In fact, in verse 16, and I like the way the New King James does this, even though the words are italicized, I think they're clearly implied by the text. He says, nevertheless, to the degree that we've already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us be of the same mind. You're climbing that hill, and you're going to be here, or you're going to be here, or you're going to be here, but what he's saying is there's no going backwards. You live up to what you know, to the degree. However far up on that climb you are, however much knowledge you have, you live up to what you know, and you keep striving on, and you keep climbing, and you keep adjusting your life, but there's no going backwards here. And all of that is just another way of saying, be thou faithful unto death. And I will give unto thee the crown of life. And so to th this morning, we're going to take a look at this on a very practical level. What does it mean to grow? What does it mean uh, to, to continue on and to press on? In other words, what must I do to stay saved? And let's just start off here, I think, with the most important part is I need to learn to grow and improve spiritually. You remember along the course of these studies, we talked about the definition of a disciple. A disciple is basically a student, a student of Jesus. And a student does three things. They study, they learn, and they apply God's word. Jesus said in the Great Commission in Matthew 28, uh, verses 19 and 20, he said, Go therefore and teach all nations, or make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things. That's a process. And we need to, to, as disciples, continue to learn and be taught and to, to study those things and to apply them to our lives. Over in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2, the Apostle Peter says, As newborn babes 
desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. And so when we first come to Christ, we have this craving. The craving is, I want more food. You know, babies do that. Little babies will cry for milk when they're hungry. Uh, they, they want, they'll let you know they're hungry. Well, as newborn babes in Christ, we need to cry out for food. We want the milk of the word, but we can't stay on the milk. We've got to progress on to the meat of the word, the Bible tells us. So there's this idea of studying and learning and applying. It's, it's, it's called growth. This is what it means to be a disciple. You've committed yourself to a lifetime of this. This is your spiritual life, and you need to commit yourself to learning and growing. Part of that process involves joining yourself with a local church. I've met Christians here and there. Uh, in fact, there's, there's a fellow up in Fishers that I know of. I won't call his name. He's a nice fellow, but he has this idea, you don't have to be a part of a local church. You don't have to be a part of a local church. Well, that's a mistake. You do have to be part of a local church. God wants you to be part of a local church. He wants you to learn. He wants you to grow. And we read, for example, in Acts 9 and verse 26, the Apostle Paul, it says, when Saul came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples. So we're supposed to join up with a local church. He was trying to join the local church at Jerusalem. We're supposed to join up because in that we find mutual encouragement. Imagine trying to live the Christian life all by yourself. Well, you could probably do it, but it would be a lot harder. Having other people to talk to and other people to lean on, like-minded people that believe the same things and, and, and stand for the same things and are learning from the same book, that gives us all encouragement. It's important for us to be together. It's important for us to be a part of a local church. It's important for us to assemble. That's why the Hebrew writer says, let's consider one another. It's not just about you. Let's consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together Together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. We need each other. We need to develop. This is part of our spiritual development. So study and learn and grow and join with a local church and that will help your study and learning and growing all that much more. But I would be remiss if I didn't also mention our private devotions. I think that's something we don't talk about nearly enough. Each of us have a private life. And we have a, a, a private relationship. Jesus talked about going into your closet when you pray to God. This is a very private thing. You, you, it's you and God. It's nobody else. And you go into your closet, into your private space, into your private time. Private time with God. We all need it. Not just the public time with other saints, but the private time with God. And, and this should be as natural as can be to us. You know, when things happen to us that, that knock us to our knees, the most natural thing in the world is to turn to God in prayer, or it should be. You know, when we're sitting here wringing our hands and what do I do, what do I do? The first thing you do is pray. The first thing you do. See, these are your private devotions. Turn, if you will, to James 5. James, I think, illustrates this for us very well. In James 5 and verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Now, if you stop and think about what James is saying here, he's, he's, he's not saying, you know, I'm suffering. What do I do? What do I do? Well, let me look up and see what James had to say about it. That should be natural. James is really trying to tell, that should, it should just be the most natural thing in the world. When you start suffering, turn to God in prayer. Is anyone suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. That should be the most natural thing in the world. To just, you know, when you're happy, just start singing those spiritual songs. I still remember even though it wasn't just totally private. It was me and a couple of other fellows. But when I preached over at Hickory Grove, uh, me and a couple of the elders would take off and go to gospel meetings here and there. Me and Keith and Edmund would take off and go to gospel meetings. And Edmund was always the guy that pitched the songs. He, he did it in a way I'd never heard done before until I went to Hickory Grove. Some of you probably heard it, I'm sure. But he pitched the songs with his voice. Do, so, me, do. And everybody would chime in. Well, we'd be driving down the road and here at Edmund, he'd do, so, me, do. And we'd just start singing. Driving down the road, going to a gospel meeting. And me and Keith and Edmund singing those songs of Zion. Singing, and those are some of my fondest memories. Going to gospel meetings with those two men. And, and singing those songs of praise. Going down the road to a gospel meeting. But all of that is developing our lives spiritually. What must I do to stay saved? There it is. I need to grow and I need to improve spiritually in my personal devotions and in my public worship with a congregation and in my studies of the Bible and learning and developing myself. That's part of what it means to be a Christian. And that is going to be the basis upon which everything else that we're going to talk about this morning flows because our spiritual growth will affect every part of our life. For example, it's going to affect my home life. 
I need to grow and improve domestically. I don't think it's any secret that families all across this land are in desperate danger. Maybe not your family because you're, you know Christ and you know the truth. But a lot of families, they don't know Christ. And the families are in danger. Divorce is rampant and children are neglected and children are abused and people are not taught the Lord. They're not taught to fear the Lord. And we as Christians need to make sure that we work on our families. We need to make sure that our families don't become another statistic. Our family doesn't become another one that's busted up and divided up because of sin. We're going to work this out. We're going to stay together. We're going to make our family everything God wants it to be. Take your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Paul talks about the family in several verses here, starting with verse 22. He addresses the wives, the queen of the house, if I may. That's, what that, that's who she is. Gentlemen, remember that. Your wife is the queen of the house. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is head of the church, and he's the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their husbands when it suits them. Well, wait a minute, that's not what that says, is it? It doesn't say that. It says in everything. You know, sadly, there's a lot of women today are offended by that. They find that, I don't have to have any man tell me what to do. Well, what about that? God said that. I didn't say that. Those are the words of God. And God says your place is to submit. And let me tell you a little secret, ladies. If you're one of these ladies who are just offended by the idea of submitting to your husband, let me tell you a little secret. Everybody's got to submit to somebody somewhere along the way. That's just a fact. Everybody, when I was a kid, I had to obey my parents. For some strange reason, I had to do it. And if I didn't, I got in some big trouble. If I didn't obey my parents. When I got to school, had to obey the teachers. Had to do what the teacher said. If you didn't, you'd get that paddle. And, and you know, when my boy was little, when by the time he was little, it was like he had to sign a form. You know, and when I was little, you didn't have to sign that form. But when he was little, I had to sign the form. Can we spank your child? I always signed it. Yep. If he needs it, you can give it to him. And he'll probably get another one when he gets home. That's what my daddy always told me. You get a spanking at school, you get another one when you get home. You see, and, and so what I'm getting at, everybody got to submit to somebody. When I got a little older and got a job, I had to do what my boss said for some strange reason. Had to do what my boss said. And then uh, when I got uh, into the church, I became a Christian, had to obey the elders. Had to do what they guide me to do, you see. Had to follow their guidance. And, and so why is it that some ladies get this idea, well, submitting to my husband is degrading. It's not. Everybody's got to submit to somebody somewhere along the way. Men have to obey, women have to obey, children have to obey. It's not degrading. Even Jesus Christ submitted to his heavenly Father. Think about that. Was that degrading to Jesus? Was that, was that downplaying his importance as God? Certainly not. It was the role that was given to him. It was the task that was given to him. So wives, please don't see this as something that's offensive or odious. It's God's will. In verse 25, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. You know, he says, love your wives. The word love here is agapeo. It's not mushy feelings. Nothing wrong with having mushy feelings for your wife. I've got mushy feelings for my wife. I do. But... He's not talking about mushy feelings here. It means she comes first. It means she, I was talking with one of these ladies the other day, and I've always used this as an illustration. Just, this just makes it practical. I mean, there's a lot of ways you can apply this, but just makes it, makes it practical. Husbands, love your wives. You put her on a pedestal, she comes first. And this is what that really means. Both of you need a new pair of shoes, but you just got enough money for one, shoe, one pair. Who gets the shoes? She does. That's what that means. Husbands, love your wife. She comes first. She's more important than you. Her needs are more important than your needs. You put her on the pedestal. That's what that means. And brethren, we've got to work on that. When we improve our lives spiritually, we study, we're trying to develop our homes and our families. And so husbands, love your... And by the way, I guarantee you, if you love your wife that way, she won't have any trouble submitting to you. Not one bit. It won't bother her one bit. Because she knows you've got her back. She knows you've got her best interests at heart. And she won't have one bit of trouble submitting to you. You're not going to make unreasonable demands and ask her to do crazy things. You're going to have her back and you're going to love her. And she will be glad to submit to you. Dropping down to chapter 6 and verse 1. Children, young people, if you're able to understand my voice, pay attention. 
Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. You know, kids always like to ask why. Why? Well, you know why? He tells you why right there. For this is right. That's all the reason you need. That's all the reason you need right there. You know, mom and dad used to say, it used to aggravate us, didn't it? We'd say, why? And dad would say, because I said so. You know, that's kind of what that is. Because God said so. Because it's the right thing to do. That's all the reason you need. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. There's a reason mom and dad tell you not to be out late at night. That it may be well with you and you may live. A kid, a teenage kid got no business traveling the roads at midnight. He got no business doing that. Ain't nothing to get into but trouble. Stay home. Stay home. Obey your parents. Do what you're supposed to do. You got no business being out and, and traveling all hours of the night and getting into mischief. Obey your mother and your father. Obey your parents and you fathers, verse 4. Do not provoke your children to wrath. Don't be mean and ornery and, and, and overbearing. Don't provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord. By the way, what's the goal of raising kids? He tells you right there in the training and admonition of the Lord. So many parents get sidetracked. My job is to make sure my child makes $250,000 a year. No, it's not. That's not your job. Your job is to make sure your child is a Christian. Doesn't make, any, doesn't make any difference if they pump gas or dig ditches or if they do make $250,000 a year. That's irrelevant. Your job is to make sure they become Christians. That's your job. Bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Make sure they're Christians. And by the way, it says you fathers, but if you want to know if mother's involved in that, oh yeah, verse 2, honor your father and your mother. So mama's involved in that too. She brings them up. And she brings them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord along with dad. Dad's the head of the house, obviously. But she helps. She's right along with that. And we need to be as Christians working on our homes, trying to make our homes better, trying to make our homes the example. I think I told you, I forget, two or three weeks ago, one of the fondest memories of my childhood is the love that my mom and dad had for each other. You know, when some kids, they grow up in a home, mom and dad's was bickering and fighting all the time. That's all they know. They carry that into their marriage, by the way. They say, well, that's how husbands and wives get along. They bicker and fight and fuss and growl and quarrel. And so when I get married, that's what I'm going to do. But that's not what I saw in my home. What I saw in my home was a mom and dad that loved each other. They hung on each other. They'd been married nearly 40 years by the time I came along, and they hung on each other like newlyweds. Just like newlyweds. They loved each other and kissed on each other right in front of me. You know, right in front of me. And, and that's some of the fondest memories of my childhood. That's, that's the legacy you want to leave your kids. You want to see, they, they need to see a home that functions the way it's supposed to function. Now, every home has troubles and every home has problems, but we can work on them. We can make them better. We can be more Christ-like. So this is what it means to stay saved. We're working on our homes. We're also working on our relationship to the civil government. We talked that over pretty good in class, didn't we, this morning? We talked that over pretty good. But we have obligations to the civil government. I said them briefly this morning. Obey, pay, and pray. That's our obligation. We obey the civil governments, Romans 13. Let every soul be subject to the civil authorities. We pay our taxes to support them in doing that work. For this reason, he says, you pay taxes for their God's minister. And yes, I'm well aware of Acts 5 and 29. When the government asks us to do something that's against God's will, then we must obey God rather than man. There's no doubt about that. Acts 5 and verse 29. And we pray for our civil authorities. I appreciate the prayer this morning. Brother Harold, did you catch that? He prayed for our rulers. He, he, he pray, that's exactly what we should do. It may not change anything, but it'll do wonders for our attitude, I guarantee you. Turn over to 1 Timothy 2. 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 and 2. And Paul says, Therefore I exhort that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all who are in authority. Do you realize what he just said? Pray for the civil rulers, the president, the governor, the members of Congress, the, the federal level, the local level, the state level. You pray for them, for all who are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. Why? Tell us why. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of our God and Savior. Another thing that we sometimes overlook, though, when in just about every country, our country especially, uh, but in just about every country there are certain rights that we have. There's nothing wrong with exercising your rights. 
that are given to you, uh, granted to you, or protected to you, might be a better way to put it, protected by the government. Turn, if you will, to Acts 25. Paul exercised his rights. They were wanting to railroad Paul, have him stand trial in an unfair place. And so we read here in Acts 25, starting with about verse 9. Festus, he was one of the rulers. He wanted to do the Jews a favor, so he's catering politically to the Jewish people. He answered Paul and he said, Are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and there be judged before me concerning these things? Paul said, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat where I ought to stand. To the Jews I've done no wrong, as you very well know. For if I am an offender or have committed anything deserving of death, I do not object to dying. But if there's nothing in these things of which these men accuse me, no one can deliver me to them. I appeal to Caesar. That was his right as a Roman citizen. I'm going to go to Caesar's judgment. I'm not going to let you railroad me into this phony trial. I'm going to the highest court in the land. I appeal to Caesar. And Festus, when he'd conferred with the council, he said, you've appealed to Caesar, then to Caesar you shall go. Nothing wrong with exercising your rights. Nothing wrong with that at all. And when the government grants you those rights, use them. Exercise them. But we as Christians should be exemplary citizens. We should be models. We should not be models of rebellion. We should be models of good citizenship. We obey, we pay our taxes, we, we, we are the best citizens in the world. We should be the example to everybody else. Not only that, but we need to grow and improve ourselves economically. We're supposed to work. That's a, a lesson that a, a lot of the younger generation has lost sight of. We're supposed to work and provide for ourselves. You've got a lot of people today that just have their hands stuck out. Drop it in my hand. Drop it in my hand. You take care of me. You take care. No, it doesn't work that way. You take care of yourself. That's what the Bible teaches. You take care of yourself. You work and you provide for yourself and for your family. Turn your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 5. In verse 8, we know the verse. We quote it all the time. He says, if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, those dwelling under his very roof, he's denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. I can't think of many things to be worse than than an unbeliever. That's pretty bad. But he says, if you don't take care of your family, you're worse than an atheist. You're worse than an unbeliever. That's strong stuff right there, isn't it? But he's saying here, you got to work because the only way you're going to provide is to get a job and have that money to provide. You've got to put a roof over their head. You've got to put food on the table. You've got to put clothes on their back. That's your job. That's your job. You're supposed to work and provide for your family. By the way, it did dawn to me this morning, there are other passages we could use, but I was just trying to narrow it down here. But he says, if anyone will not provide for his own, and we usually think his own family, and that's true, but think of this, his own self too. His own self. You've got to provide for your own self, and you've got to provide for your own family. That's your job, you see. And as Christians, we need to set the example for everybody else. Don't be like those who have their hands stuck out. Drop it in my hand. Let somebody else take care of me. That's not the way it works. Even, ever since the Garden of Eden, think of that. God says, in the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread. You're supposed to work. You're supposed to provide for yourself and provide for your, your family, you see. And so we're to grow. As we develop ourselves economically, we do pay our taxes. We talked about that this morning in Bible study. Everybody benefits from tax money. We pay taxes for the police officer so we can call him if something happens and we need help. We pay taxes for the fire department so we can call them if something happens and we need their help. We pay taxes for the emergency responders so that we can call them if we need their help. We pay taxes for the road so we have a nice way to get from here to there. And so everybody benefits from tax money. Pay the taxes. Also, as you make that money, support the local church. I've asked the question before. I'll ask it again. Have you given the Lord a raise lately? Did you get a raise this year? If you got a raise this year, did you give the Lord a raise? Those are things we should think about as Christians. When our salary goes up, our contributions should go up. When we get a raise, the Lord should get a raise because we're trying to be models of what it means to handle our money. Instead of wasting our money on drugs and booze and sin and gambling, then we use our money to provide for ourselves, to provide for the local church, to provide for the needy. We use our money in godly ways. In fact, Ephesians 4.28 says, Let him who stole steal no longer, but let him labor working with his hands 
that he may have something to give him who has need. So we also share with the needy when we have a little extra. But we need to also understand that we need to grow and improve socially. See, all of this is what it means to be a disciple. This is, this is what you're committing to when you become a Christian. And when we start off with that one, improving ourselves spiritually, we start off with number one, it's going to affect everything else on that list. It's going to affect every aspect of your life. Sometimes I've seen people try to divide their lives. Well, this is my spiritual life, and, and this is my business life, and over here in my business life I can be crooked and dishonest. No, you can't. You're a Christian you see. And so that affects your entire life. And so when you're a Christian, it's going to affect everything in your life. And we get down here to, to the social. I'm talking about how we interact with other people. That's what I'm talking about. Interacting with other people in the community. We need to be good neighbors. Now let me, let me, let me be a little bit more specific. Turn to Luke chapter 10. We know the story of the Good Samaritan. This is a great story. Great parable. Luke chapter 10, we'll start the reading in about verse 25. If I can ever get my Bible over there. There we go. Behold, a certain lawyer, verse 25, stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Well, isn't that kind of what we're studying about today? What shall I do to inherit eternal life? What do I do to stay saved? What do I do to be saved? He says, well, what's written in the law? What's your reading of it? I like Jesus' answer. What's the Bible say? He, he didn't say, what's your, what's your think so's or how do you feel about it? What's your opinion? He said, what's the Bible say? What's, what's written in the law? So he answered and he said, he quoted the law to him. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said, good job. You've answered rightly. Do this. And you'll live. Well, that wasn't good enough for this fellow. He wanted to justify himself. What that really means is I want to make sure that I get myself covered here without having to change a whole lot. He wanted to justify himself the way he's living his life without having to change. He wants to justify himself the way he's living it right now without having to change. So he asked Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? I want you to pin it down for me, Lord. How far does this go? And I love, as Jesus tells this parable, the way he turns this around on the man. Jesus is trying to tell us here that it doesn't matter who your neighbor is, it matters that you be a neighbor. Did you ever notice that? Did you ever notice that in the text? Let's, let's, let's read the parable here. Let's start here with verse, if I can find it again, I lost, I lost my place. Verse uh, 30, 29. He wanted to justify himself, said, Jesus, who is my neighbor? Jesus said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. This guy got beaten and mugged and robbed. Now by chance a certain priest came down, a religious man. A certain priest came down the road. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. I don't want to get involved. Mm, that man looks like he's been through some hard times. I don't want to get involved. I'm just going to go away. Likewise, a Levite, one of God's people, the priest and the Levite, these are God's people. When he arrived at the place, he came and looked and passed by on the other side. Mm, I'm not getting involved either. But a certain Samaritan, now understanding the culture, Samaritan was half Jew, half Gentile, and they were frowned upon by the Jews. They didn't like him. Didn't like him. They, that wasn't fair. It wasn't right. But that's the way it was. And a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. Think of that. The non-religious man had more faith and compassion than the religious men. Think about that. That happens sometimes, doesn't it? That's sad. It shouldn't be that way, but it happens. He had compassion. And he went to him, verse 34, and bandaged his wounds and poured on oil. He got involved. Let me bandage you up. Let me put oil and wine on. That's medication. Anointing with oil and wine. Wine was an antiseptic. So pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn, in our language, a hotel in our modern day park. Took him to a hotel and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he didn't just say, well, you're on your own. He took two denarii, that's two days wage. He took two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. And he said, you take care of him. And whatever more you spend, if you spend more than that, when I come back, I'll pay you. I want to make sure this guy gets what he needs. Now, verse 36, here it comes. Which of these three do you think was neighbor? 
to him who fell among the thieves. This guy says, who is my neighbor? Jesus said, that's the wrong question. The question is, how can I be your neighbor? That's the question. How can I be a neighbor? Who was neighbor to the one who fell among the thieves? Don't try to narrow it down. Who, what's the least amount I can do to get by? That's not the point. Who can I be a neighbor to? Who can I help? Who can I do for? And this is, this is our social interaction with other people, you see. Treat other people with de decency and dignity and respect and help them, whether they're like you or not. The Samaritan wasn't like the guy laying on the road. Very likely he was a Jew. And very likely that Jew would have despised the Samaritan. That's the way it usually was. But the Samaritan helped him anyway. I'll be a neighbor anyway. I'll do good anyway. I'll do the right thing anyway. Regardless of what that man thinks of me or what the priest thinks of me or what the Levite thinks of me, I'm going to do the right thing. This is the idea of social interaction and doing the right thing. I told you another passage. I mentioned this the other day, 1 Peter 4, 9. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. And the word hospitality, we usually tend to think of that in terms of having our friends over. Nothing wrong with that, but that's not what the Bible word hospitality means. The word that's translated hospitality literally means love of strangers. I've mentioned to you about folks up at Fishers. They're on the lookout when, when people come to visit. Come out to lunch with us. Come over to the house tonight. Come over to Dairy Queen with us after services. That's what you call learning and growing and developing socially. That's what you call kindness to strangers. That's what you call hospitality, you see. That's, okay. That's the way we should be. That's the way all of us should be. We need to learn and do that, you see. And this is what it takes to stay saved. Someone said, that's a whole lot of work. You know, you, you, when, we, when you were going through those early ones, what must I feel and what must I believe and what must I know? And what, You were making it real simple and just two or three things, you know. I'm a sinner and Jesus died for me. This is where the real work begins, isn't it? This is where the real work begins. After you've obeyed the gospel. See, you're just getting started when you obey the gospel. That stuff's simple. That's first principle stuff. You're just getting started. You're not done. You've got a whole lot more to do. Starting from this day forward, it's 24-7, 365 service to the Lord. That's what it's all about. That's what you're committing to when you stand up here and you say, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and you let somebody immerse you. That's what you're committing to right there. A whole lifetime of that. Listen to me carefully because we're getting ready to extend the invitation. If you're not willing to make this commitment right here, you're not ready to obey the gospel. You're just not ready. You may want to, but if you're not willing to do this after you come up out of that water, you're not ready. So I encourage you to get yourself in a frame of mind where you are ready. Because there's a whole lot more to do after you're baptized than there is before you're baptized. You see, that's the easy stuff. Believing in Jesus and repenting of your past sins and, and obeying the gospel is the easy stuff. Now comes the hard stuff. Now comes the important stuff. And if you're ready this morning, then we'd be more than happy to assist you in obeying the gospel. Take out your songbook. Turn to number 283, the song of invitation. It reminds us, in fact, I like the way this song is written. We'll just kind of take a look at all these verses real quick, very briefly here. But he talks about this great day, but he describes it from three points of view. Okay, In verse 1, it's a great day. That means great things are going to be happening when Jesus comes. He's talking about the, the judgment day when Jesus returns. Great things are going to be happening. First of all, Jesus is coming back. That's pretty great, isn't it? He's coming back from heaven. He's been up there for 2,000 years. He's coming back, you see. And so that's going to be great. And he's coming back with his angels. And so that's a great thing. When he comes back, the graves are going to open up and all the dead are going to raise. That's pretty great stuff, isn't it? That's some great things happening. There's going to be a great judgment that takes place. And so there's some great things happening on that day. That's why it's a great day. In verse 2, he calls it a bright day. But its brightness, he says, shall only come to them that love the Lord. It's a bright day, but it's not going to be a bright day for everybody. It's going to be a bright day for those who are Christians. It's going to be a bright day for those who are doing these things. But for those who are disobedient and careless and don't really care about the Lord, that brings us to verse 3. It's going to be a sad day for them. Same day. Think of that. Same day. It's a great day. Great things happening. Bright day for those who love the Lord. But it's a sad day. For the sinner. 
because he's going to hear his doom. Depart, I know you not. Those are going to be the worst words that you will ever hear in your life. When you hear those words on the judgment day, depart from me, you curse it into the everlasting fire, prepare for the devil and his angels. Because when those words are spoken, if those words are ever spoken to you, that's it. There is no appeal. Because that's the Supreme Court speaking right there. There's no place else to go. There's no one else to turn to. It's over for all eternity. But here's the interesting thing about all this. You get to decide what kind of day that's going to be. The judgment day is coming, and you get to decide what kind of day that's going to be for you. Is it going to be a bright day for you because you've obeyed the gospel and you're faithful, or is it going to be a sad day for you because you were careless and neglectful and you hear those terrible words? You get to decide how that day is going to be. If you're here this morning, you're not a Christian. We're going to sing this song. We're singing to you. We're trying to encourage you. We beg with you, please. Obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Believe in him as the son of God. Repent of your sins. Confess his name. Let one of us take you into this tank of water right here and immerse you, baptize you for the forgiveness of your sins. Come up and start living for Jesus. Being everything that you can be. And you're not going to be perfect. I've been at this for 40 years. I'm still not perfect. I'm a long way from it, but I'm working on it. I'm working on it. That's what it means to be a Christian. If you're willing and ready to do that, won't you come while we stand and while we sing?